this is just a quick um, correction, I guess, or something. Um, please do not misunderstand when I talk about 1 Corinthians 15. I want to talk about that real quick here. And uh, there's a verse in here that says, um, uh, it's talking about the resurrection mainly. And that's why I say, that's why I say it's not talking about the rapture. Um, and uh, let's see here. Here it is. Um, oh, okay, here it is. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 is often quoted by uh, pre-trib rapture proponents. Uh, that uh, 1552 says, In a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Okay, what I was trying to say was this is not a description of the rapture. And I still maintain that. This is not talking about the rapture specifically. Now, does that mean just because I don't talk about, say, that, just because I'm saying it's not about the rapture, does that mean that I'm denying that this uh, happens around the time of the rapture? Obviously, obviously not. And I don't think that anybody would have any reason to believe that I'm not talking about the rapture because this is about the resurrection. And that is one of the things that I don't like about the pre-trib is that it overshadows the return of Jesus Christ and the resurrection two events where our hope is fulfilled in the resurrection and our hope of Christ returning is fulfilled there's another thing that happens that's overblown and takes away from the glory of those two events and that's just a simple gathering of the elect that happens and Look at First Thessalonians uh, four, and I'll clarify this. Let's see, First Thessalonians four. It says, um, "For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so them which are asleep in Jesus Christ, Christ God will bring with Him." So that's where First Corinthians fifteen comes in. For, for it says, "For this, if we say unto you by the word, Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep." And then he then he talks about the thing that really is going to happen that's the most central event. And he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That is when Jesus returns. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then it's talking about that. The dead in Christ rising first. That's 1 Corinthians. That happens in a twinkling of an eye when the, they are resurrected but not Jesus descending from heaven. That doesn't happen in a twinkling of an eye. There's no reason for me to believe it from Scripture. It could be in a twinkling, but it doesn't say that. And then it says, Then we in our life or remains shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It doesn't say that happens in a twinkling of an eye there. So that's what I'm saying is in 1 Corinthians 15, when it talks about the transformation, the resurrection happening in the twinkling of an eye, it's not talking about how fast the resurrection happens. And now we got all these Tim LaHaye books and all this stuff that talk about uh, an instantaneous rapture that happens. And they quote 1 Corinthians 15 totally out of context. So that's what I was trying to say was that has nothing to do with the, the rapture other than obviously it necessitates the rapture. I don't think the rapture could happen without that happening first. Um, now speaking of this Trump of an angel, uh, <clears throat> it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of an archangel, so there's Jesus descending, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. It doesn't describe what it looks like, but it describes what it sounds like, and what happens. Now we'll look at in uh, Matthew, uh, and this is talking about, we got to understand what he's talking about. What Paul is mainly talking about in 1 Thessalonians 4 is the resurrection. I mean, uh, yeah, the resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians, he's also talking about the resurrection, okay? So the resurrection is the central thing that's being described. This is not about the return of the Lord specifically, although it's mentioned in there. Now let's look at Matthew 24. And this Jesus is talking about the resurrection. 
and provides more, not, the, I mean, he's, Jesus is talking about the return, his return. And then he describes it with more detail than he does in Thessalonians. Because look, it says, they asked him, tell us when shall these things be, in verse 3, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. So he's showing them what it's going to look like when he comes back. And that's why he describes so many visible things. And so he said, uh, there's a lot of description of things in here, but the main things that happens is that um, he describes exactly what happens on the day of the Lord. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So he's describing what it's going to look like on that day. Thessalonians doesn't describe what it's going to look like, or any of the signs. He just describes what must happen sequentially. And then, uh, the verse, next verse, this says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall the tribes of earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory so they'll see this it shows what it's going to look like they'll see the son of man coming but he will appear they will see him and he'll be coming and then it says he shall send his angel with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the other heaven to the other that is what is called the rapture and you could apply the same kind of a concept with corinthians it also describes only the resurrection doesn't describe the rapture. Okay, even though the rapture happens there, it doesn't describe it. So we don't sit here and read Corinthians and say, well, Jesus is not going to come back because when the rapture happens, there's no description of Jesus coming back. I mean, when the resurrection happens, uh, there's no description of Jesus coming back, do we? No. See, Paul does not describe all those details in here. Neither does he describe those in 1 Thessalonians 4. He describes it all in different parts of the Bible. Jesus specifically answered a question, and he described every step along the way. So that would be more authoritative about it. The same thing goes for Revelation. People expect to look for the resurrection and the rapture and all those things in the Revelation, but it's not about that. The Revelation is about the tribulation and the plagues to come and the judgment of God to come and the kingdom to come. It covers a whole bunch, so it doesn't have enough room to to um to include every little detail like that and so it, it assumes that people know that they're resurrection and the same thing goes for daniel chapter 12 uh it's talking about the antichrist in daniel 12 probably i think it's talking about the antichrist so in daniel chapter 12 it doesn't describe exactly when things happen in sequence and what it's going to look like instead it just tells you what is going to happen as far as the power struggle that happened. So it uses words like, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which, prince which standeth for the children of the people, and there shall be a time of trouble. So then it happens to mention the tribulation. There was, it shall be a time of trouble such as never once since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So it, it's... Th that doesn't describe a sequence of events. It just describes what's going to happen all at that particular uh, chunk of time. And I think also that suggests how long the tribulation is really going to be. That it's actually the great tribulation is going to happen just before Jesus comes up. But, uh, probably three and a half years because if you look in the description. And so then it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of earth shall awake and some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then it says, And they that shall be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So this is a final thing that happens after the tribulation. Uh, the whole tribulation is just the stuff that happens before the tribulation. The abomination of desolation happens in chapter 11, just before that. But then the resurrection happens at the end. So this pretty much proves, right, it's clear as a bell. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, wow, I can't believe I hadn't seen this before. That, 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 the trib, that all these events, the abomination that happens and all that stuff, after he, the Antichrist gets destroyed when he comes. 11.45, it says, and yet he shall come as an, and none shall help him. 
you know, he shall plant his tabernacles in his palace. And it talks about the abomination, I think, in there somewhere. I have to find it's a very long chapter. And then in 12.1, it talks about um, time of trouble after all this stuff. <clears throat> you know, so um, uh, it it's baffles me as to how these experts, so-called experts, could have come up with this, this doctrine. I think I really question their motives. I think they were telling people what they wanted to hear. I think they made up a fable because they were people were afraid when they read the book of Revelation about all the things that the Christians would have to go through. And the best way to do that, to make it uh, yourself a popular teacher, is to teach them what they want to hear and say, you're not going to go have to go through the tribulation that Revelation 1, 2, and 3, uh, that, that is not about you. You do not have to endure to the end. You don't have to do these works. That's only for the tribulation saints, blah, 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 blah. That's hyper-dispensationalism. And that that thwarts the gospel of Christ because the very Jesus said the very words that I speak are the words of life. Why would he say that if just believing in him is salvation? Then why would he say that his words give life? That's because you listen to him. It's those that hear him, right? His sheep will hear his voice. If you hear him, you'll be saved. It says, I will send a prophet and those that hear him of my people will be saved and those that don't will be destroyed. 